It was evening on that first day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jewish authorities. Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed him his hands and his side, and then the disciples rejoiced after they had seen the Lord. Many of us are familiar with this story. Frankly, we should be. It's the same exact reading every single year on the Sunday after Easter. But this year, it seems particularly applicable. It's the night of Easter, and the disciples are locked away together. Why? The Bible's clear. It's fear. Fear of the Jewish authorities. You see, there were rumors of his appearance that very morning. Mary and the other women said they saw him, but you know how things go when things get twisted, when people get excited and, and, and adrenaline pumps. And I mean, stories just happen, right? This was surely a bit dramatic. They were scared because, well, they knew well that the authorities came after Jesus. They might come after them too. If indeed his body was gone, that means only one thing. Surely they were the suspects. It was only a matter of time until Roman soldiers came after them as well. But then as they sat together, locked in fear, locked away from the world he taught them to love, he appeared. Jesus shows himself to them. He pronounces to them peace. Shalom. And they believe. They believe, though, after they see him. But there was one, Thomas, who was not there that day. Now, Thomas gets a bad rap in the story. Let's be very honest. If I said to you, like, let's play the old match game, blank Thomas, what are you going to say? Doubting, right? Everyone says and knows doubting Thomas. Well, Thomas wasn't really a doubter. He simply wanted nothing more than the others had already gotten. They saw him. They heard him. They wanted, he wanted the same. And where was Thomas anyway? Let's just think about that for a second. If the disciples were locked away for fear of Jewish authorities, where was Thomas? Why wasn't he there? Perhaps he was the one who put on the mask and went to the grocery stores for cleaning supplies, Clorox wipes, and toilet paper. We don't know where Thomas was that day. Perhaps he was considered essential and couldn't stay home. All we know is that Thomas was the only one who was not holed up with fear that night. But that when he saw, when he heard, when he responded, it was my Lord and my God that he proclaimed. Now, we don't really know what happened after this because John immediately changes to a different story. But what we do know is this. After they saw him and believed, they no longer were hiding. They were freed from the prison of their own fear and anxiety. What made this difference? I believe it was because they had an encounter with the holy, and it changed their lives. I think that we're in what, week number 734 now of this craziness? Hold up with fear? Some have ventured out to get supplies or to make a living. Many of us are just, frankly, locked away, hoping that we and those we love are okay. I'm not sure why, but this week was, for me, a really rough month. But we made it. And we will make it. But we need, or at least, let me just say, I need, to be reminded of what it is that gives me the much-needed peace that sees me through. It's the gift of the spiritual people that call it mindfulness. 
Mindfulness is defined as a mental state achieved by focusing one's awareness on the present moment while calmly acknowledging and accepting one's feelings, one's thoughts, and one's bodily sensations. Mindfulness is a spiritual practice. It's training ourselves to be able to stop and discern what is happening around us at any given moment. Here's an example. Maybe I'm short-fused at home and everybody around me is getting on my nerves. I start getting short and snappy with my loved ones. I'm just not a pleasant person to be around at the present moment. I can live into that or... I can stop the cycle of frustration and understand what is really going on in my life. Maybe it was an encounter at work that day. Maybe it was a conversation with a friend or a family member that set me off. Maybe I'm not attending to my own needs, and so I'm feeling frustrated and burnt out. Maybe I'm being passive-aggressive about something else. And instead of being honest and addressing that issue with whoever or whatever is bothering me, I'm going to punish everybody else around me by being nasty. We've all been there, haven't we? What's wrong, dear? Nothing. Nothing at all. Never mind. Mindness is the way we train our minds to be attuned to how we are really feeling. What's really happening in our bodies, in our minds, in our spirits, in our surroundings when those disturbing emotions arise? You know, rage and anger and jealousy and bitterness and frustration and envy and resentment and the list goes on and on and on. That when they arise and show their ugly faces, we can recognize it for what it is and find our peace. Instead of reacting and being stuck in the moment, mindfulness helps us to find the clarity to stop. What's really going on here? Why am I reacting the way I am? Why do I feel the way I feel? And then I can deal with it as it needs to be dealt with and I can return to peace. Sounds good, right? But it's tough. It's so easy to just live in the moment of our anger or our fear or our anxiety. It's so easy to live in the moment of our emotions. It's tough to break the cycle. But it is like learning an instrument or learning how to become an athlete. It's spiritual practice, and it's something we get better at with practice. The more time we spend doing it, the better we get. The disciples had three years, didn't they? They were in training, if you will. They had three years to be attuned to His voice, to His message, to His ways to His peace and His presence. What we see in today's story is paralyzing fear and anxiety giving way to peace through an encounter with the holy. That's all well and good, but how do we get there? It's not accidentally. We don't come to a state of heightened mindfulness and peace accidentally any more than we become concert pianists accidentally. It's intentional and it's methodical. As your pastor, I would say to you it's absolutely essential. For me, it's time in meditation and prayer. 10 or 15 minutes lighting a candle in quiet reflection. No words, no thoughts, just focusing on quieting my mind so that the holy can speak. But that doesn't happen for me if I never stop and listen. It never happens if I don't turn off the television, the music, the world around me. I have to make a conscious decision to literally go into a room 
light a candle, shut the door, sit on my meditation mat, and listen. I remember a pastor teaching what is now a very silly and trite example when I was a child, but it does hold some truth. The Holy Spirit, he said, is a gentleman. The Spirit will never force itself on you. You have to invite it in. Now, that doesn't square completely with the Pentecost story, so you have to sort of give it a little bit of leeway. But there is a point here. True. Lasting peace. True, lasting peace does not force itself upon us. It's something we invite. It's something we cultivate. It's something we nurture and grow like a seed that takes fruition in our lives and grows into something beneficial. We do that by developing spiritual practices that foster the gift of mindfulness. Prayer, quiet time, reading scriptures or other spiritual meditative writings, devotional texts, music, writing poetry, even getting your hands dirty with paint or clay or the soil from your own garden. We may all have our different ways of getting there, but getting there is the point. Perhaps more than ever right now. So like the disciples, we can either stay locked behind closed doors in fear and anxiety of what our future holds, of what our present doesn't hold, or we can look for ways to see and to hear the peace of the Holy One standing in our midst, calling us to live, to love, and to hope for another day. Amen.